Uh, it's the second block of this workshop. It's dedicated to the users of DL2 and the usage of DL2. We have prepared three presentations. So Michal will kick off this block. He did his PhD at the Polish Academy of Science in the context of fluid structure interaction. And he recently defended his PhD thesis successfully. Um, and now he will present some of his results. So I'm looking forward. Oh, thank you. And it's been a while since uh, the last time I had an opportunity to speak at the little workshop. Something's changed since then. Obviously, we are not able to meet in person, but as you mentioned, I've got my PhD. So I guess I needed a global pandemic to just to finish it up and be locked at home. But proceeding, that's, that's, that's me. Uh, in the background, there is a cluster. Uh, small cluster in my institute. And the gymnastic ribbon in the front uh, is an example of the free structure interaction phenomena. Uh, so to be precise, uh, my goal was to develop a parallel monolithic matrix-free solver for free structure interaction problems. Uh, I wanted to use, uh, uh, squeeze out every possible floating point, uh, flops per, flops per second from the CPU. Thus, I needed to cut down the memory usage. Therefore, the matrix-free methods comes handy. Uh, so to settle down the scope of this presentation, I will be talking about a monolithic approach in the ARE uh, frame of reference, finite element discretization, of course. Uh, I will be considering incompressible flow, incompressible solid, so the compressible flow is quite crucial because of stability reasons. There are some issues. Uh, 2D, 3D cases in PhD, there are only 2D, but it's work as well in 3D. Uh, so the first to start, uh, we start from uh, Newton equations that is on the interface. Uh, this is the traction balance on the interface. And the continuity of velocity is basically a non-slip condition. Uh, so velocity is continuous across the interface because of the non-slip condition. There is a traction uh, traction uh, traction balance uh, and uh, uh, momentum balance instance each one domain is called Cauchy equations. It looks like this. It is a just a Newton law. Uh, so, so the arbitrary or Lagrangian formulation is when you uh, trace everything in the undefined configuration. For the solids, it's kind of, kind of natural uh, because you have a natural formulation, but for the fluid, you've got some kind of arbitrary, and thus it is kind of, uh, it is called Ailey. So after you plug in the uh, interface condition, you get a, quite a nice equation. Uh, so in arbitrary general formulation, it virtually looks like that. Uh, so this mesh represents the initial configuration and it moves reverse when the, the whole thing moves. Uh, so the last thing we need to close the system is models. So for the fluid, it's nothing special. Uh, we consider a Newtonian fluid. And for the solid, we uh, Nicol Newtonian compressible fluid. fluid. And for the solid, we consider moon riven solid. It is a bit simplified thing. Uh, deformation gradients, uh, transform the deformation gradients to the uh, deformed configuration. And the uh, moon riven solid consists of two parts. There is one, one coefficient we skip, we assume that's zero. Uh, that in 2D, that's not a big deal because only the sum of these two coefficients is important. And in 2D, it's... Uh, uh, equal to a neo model. In 3D, it's a bit, uh, uh, it makes a change, but for simplicity, for simple implementation, we, we skipped this, this part. So the uh, stress is like that, and this, this is not, nothing unusual. And there is a challenge because, uh, uh, because of incompressibility constraints. Uh, we, there are, there are several, several ways to formulate the, the solid is incompressible. We can choose the determinant of deformation that's set to zero. 
that want to match with the constraints for this fluid. So we uh, so work around it and said there is the derivative of uh, volume production is zero. So that it, the volume is conserved, but there is a downside of it. Uh, due to numerical errors, there will be some, uh, some volume appearing or disappearing and, we, and it will not be corrected. Uh, uh, and will, it will not be corrected. So the problem may rise. That is exactly what is happening. Uh, so I came up with the idea that to propose some relaxation of the volume. So that dump the additional volume or relax it. And it works pretty well with additional dumping. Uh, so when we plug everything into the, uh, the equations, we've got, uh, we've got a scheme that is called fully implicit. When you skip all the colors, you've got the fully implicit scheme. Uh, we now do it with, with replace the time derivative with BDF formula, backward formula for BDF because of stability. We do it with second order. So, but the problem is you can end up with this system of equation that is nonlinear and pretty challenging to solve. Uh, the remedy for that one is to go uh, balance uh, between explicit and implicit formulation uh, so that it is still stable, but it is much easier to solve. So first things first, uh, there is a, a, a incompressibility constraints and it has to be solved implicitly because of added mass effect and uh, it won't be stable if it's not implicit. So it's, it has to be. Uh, the geometry fortunately can be solved explicitly. It, you use explicit scheme for the geometry and for the momentum, this A, A block, we use uh, mixed from like mixed stem implicit. Uh, the time derivative is implicit. The stress, uh, the stress linear part of stress uh, is, is in fact implicit because for the fluid it's implicit. For the solid, uh, it is, it, we remove the displacement here by velocity by using previous displacement in current velocity. So displacement here does not appear and it is implicit for the velocity. So here it is explicit for uh, displacement. So current displacement does not matter. So it is basically the volume pressure formulation. The un prima unknowns are volume and pressure. Uh, so it is a bit improved scene because it's set second order. The, uh, the convective part is, is also semi-explicit as it steps 35. The idea is just copied from them. Uh, so if you do that, uh, uh, once per time step, you've got some, some kind of scan scheme that is stable, but you can iteratively improve the solutions. And if you do it twice for, for me, uh, you get some kind of predictor character scheme. So that's why it is from, it, it is just two iteration of fixed point method. One is just standard to see in scheme and two is for the, uh, and two iterations for predictor character. The reason, several, there are several reasons to use a predictor character scheme. Uh, you can uh, use, uh, uh, can do a much easier predictor scheme. And there is, there are some, several substeps to solve that. And the most important one is implicit scheme. Uh, and it's, it's virtualized thought problem. So the A is, is kind of some kind of the A is thought problem and the divergence free constraints. So, uh, yeah, so do I will focus on that step. Uh, uh, the system of linear equations. After, after the finite element discretization, after introducing the triangulation, uh, we get a finite element discretization. And from that, we get a system of linear equation that is exactly looks like stout because that's not stout. And we've got, if we, uh, from geometric point of view, we've got one mesh that is coarse and we refine it in several times. So we get a sequence of, of the, the problems and we can build a multi-level uh, precondition for that using this one. So the, the idea is on the coarse solver, you can solve easily the problem, but the approximation the solution is, is quite rough. On the fine level, you cannot solve the problem directly, but the solution is, is quite good. So to use that, uh, we just uh, use the, uh, the interesting idea of, from multi-grid. Uh, 
So there is there is everything things comes down to how to smooth the solution, how how to design the matrix scheme. Uh, so how to uh, this these two papers uh, gave me idea how the smoother should work for the Stokes problem. It is smoothing the uh, if you look at the Stokes problem, uh, it is symmetric positive defined, but inside the divergence free, free space. So this uh, this house these two papers shows you how to construct the smoother inside the divergence free space uh, quite easily. This paper shows you that uh, you do not have you can violate a bit uh, divergence free space. So it can be some divergent. Uh, uh, you don't have to be strict with it. Uh, this paper is uh, it shows that. Uh, multi grid combined with Krewa subspace solver, namely CG, for uh, this continuous coefficient problem is a good idea. So, and, and to improve the convergence, I've used the Chebyshev smoothers uh, from, from DU2. So, the proposed method was, was uh, multi grid proves GM REST. That's, that's a, 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 a right, right Krewa subspace solver. And implementation was done inside DIL2, so it is parallel, it is matrix free inside the um, matrix free framework. Uh, so everything comes down to this. It is the very standard matrix scheme. There is nothing special about it. Uh, the key point is the smoother. You just, there is nothing special about it. Uh, the key point is the smoother. Uh, this smoother is, is looks very much like, like the Stokes problem. Uh, in case of uh, perfect smoother, uh, you have zero here. So it is exactly uh, the uh, A, B, B, zero, and approximation of A. So you are smoothing directly inside the divergence free space. Uh, so the A is a simple, simple approximation of, of this one, so it's a smoother, but you need to have a good approximation of S through complement for the smoother, and it, that's challenging. Uh, a, I can construct with, with just Chebyshev smoother. For S, I can compute some approximation of diagonal of S, and then improve with Chebyshev, Chebyshev operators, and then plug it in inside multi-grid cycle. So that's the one idea to, to obtain S. I can wrap it around inside CG. That's another idea to get it. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, it comes out that I do not even need this inner multi grid. Uh, and it, it's worse uh, as it should work as, as we, with this inner multi grid. So, this third option uh, this is the best one because there's no inner multi grid, that's, that's the cheapest one. So, that's the smooth part. So we need every, we have everything we need uh, to build the fluid structure interaction solver. And I may proceed to the results. So that's the cluster I was using. That's from computation ground from Luca. Uh, so there is, there is, I will note that there is biggest simulation I was, I was doing. It was consisted on little bit less than 1 billion degrees of freedom because I've got some bug. Uh, at because probably because 32 bit indexing of degrees of freedom. I didn't thought about it when I was implementing it several couple of years ago. So, so first things first, uh, the accuracy of the, the scheme. So if it is really uh, provides you so the solution of uh, of the of the free interaction, pro interaction problem. So it turns out that uh, yes, that's that's basically very very close to the, what it should be. The model uh, inside this Turek benchmark is a bit a little bit different in the referential results. It's Sandvik and Kirchhoff, not Muller Ripin. That's why there is there is a difference here, but here is extremely close in FSC two. Uh, so we, we just assume that it's, it's good enough. So the, there are more interesting things. Uh, the solver performance. Uh, this, this is measured inside FSC3 test because the Reynolds number here is 200. And you have two steps. The predictor is uh, you have fully explicit advection. 
So it's a symmetric problem to solve. So the performance is pretty much stable. And for corrector, it's a semi-implicit advection. So the performance varies over time. And it's, it's good enough. 30 iterations is good enough, but you, I can do better because uh, operator already gives you a good approximation of the solution. So uh, you, for corrector just is there to as, assure that the, the simulation is stable. And this comes out that uh, you can lower the, uh, the corrector tolerance. Uh, and here uh, you are not just you know, lowering lower, lower number of iteration because the tolerance is lower, but the solver converge extremely well in the first few iterations. So you are using uh, the best, uh, best range of the solver. So the number of iterations significantly drops. So here is here is the number of iterations inside. Uh, uh, yeah, this this is comparison, and uh, I don't have a plot with results, but results are identical. There is about one percent of error or something like that. Uh, if you ask, there is some time shift, but the 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 error when you shift the time about a fraction of a time step, their 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 error is really small, unnoticeable. So the second thing we are interested in is FGMRS performance. It, it, uh, this is done on 196 scores in 2D. It was measured on FEC2 2 test. Uh, so uh, in the perfect line, this is time spent per one degree of freedom. So the perfect line would be flat, uh, but uh, because of uh, the communication, the communication is killing the solver in this range. So the true performance is, is here when it flattens out and it's almost perfectly flat as you can see. Uh, so in 3D, we have also a 3D test and uh, I, I will show th that's, that's the movie from the beginning of the presentation. And uh, the, the, the Reynolds number there is, is uh, 2000. So it's 10 times bigger Reynolds number and the number of iterations is, are lower, in fact, and it performs very well if they're, in fact, better in than in 2D. Ah, and uh, by the way, that, uh, that purple line here, this line, uh, is extension that is basically a Laplace solver. So this distance shows you how far we are from the Laplace solver. And uh, so that shows you basically that it is Sometimes it's three to five times slower than Laplace. So for me, it's kind of uh, quite nice results. Same in 3D. Uh, in 3D, sometimes it's twice slower than Laplace. So it's it's very good. I consider it to be a good result. Uh, so finally, the the two -like benchmark kind of two -like three -like benchmark 3D. The Reynolds number was 2000, and somehow it is significantly more stable because the time step size was one one hundredth of a second. The, the problem size was 30 million degrees of, free, 30 million degrees of freedom. And uh, the, the predictor, the, the solver performance is surprisingly good because it's converges in sometimes even in three iterations depending on the, on the configuration. And predictor is pretty much constant. Around eight degrees of uh, the eight iterations per per time step. So let me close the presentation with some remarks. So there is original contribution. There are, I've made a, a generalization that's of scheme that was in the literature. It was for it was not for hyperelastic. So I've made hyperelastic for second order. It was it is also now a second order. The precondition uh, is mostly my idea it is it is now work submitted we are, we are dealing with reviews and it is it ca capable of dealing with strongly variable coefficient that contrast is about oh the contrast is up to 10 to power 12 10 to 12 anything you want anything that does not go near to, to double precision uh, is okay there is there is a new thing that is volumetric correction method and the whole implementation and the main most important uh, conclusion for me is that the stocks, the fluid stretch interaction problem is in fact a fancy stocks problem with extra steps. So if you know how to solve the stocks pro uh, problem, you also know how to solve the fluid stretch interaction problem. 
So thank you.